My name is Rick Brenner, and I'm in the modern Turkish city of Izmir. But Izmir is built on top of ancient Smyrna, which was a magnificent city in the Roman province of Asia. Smyrna had about 100,000 people during the time of the New Testament when the church was being established here. And I'm standing in the state Agora, which was the marketplace. The city was so big it had several of these marketplaces, one near the harbor that has never been excavated, and this one, which by the way, was the largest Agora, it was the largest market ever known in the entire Roman world. And it was magnificent. It had three levels, three stories, it was adorned with all kinds of sculptures and gods and idols and emperors, and it was the site of horrific persecution. Early records record for us that believers were dragged into this place and they were killed out in the open space of the Agora as pagan spectators watched. When Jesus spoke in the book of Revelation chapter two to the church of Smyrna, he identified the fact that they were really struggling. They couldn't get jobs because they were Christians, those who were employed had lost their jobs, they were suffering financially, and many of them were dying for their faith. Jesus even warned them that they would be cast into prison, but that their troubles would be limited. It would only be for a specific period of time, and then they would come out the victors. And I wanna tell you that it doesn't matter what the devil tries to do to you, in the end, you'll be the victor. If you'll stand on the word of God, if you'll stay true to the testimony of Jesus and to the things that God has said to you and refuse to budge, troubles eventually go. And when they go, when the pressure lets up, you are there remaining as the victor. In fact, that really is the story of the church in Smyrna. He who endures to the end always wins. And that is what I'm gonna to talk to you about today. I'm seated on andesite stones, which are the ruins of the earliest settlement of Smyrna. This particular area is thousands of years old, and this is where the worship of Sybil in Smyrna first began. And when the gospel first came to this city, this was a dark place, and a lot of persecution took place here. And this is why in Revelation chapter 2, verse 10, Jesus told the believers in Smyrna, Fear none of those things which thou shalt suffer. Behold, the devil shall cast some of you into prison that ye may be tried, and you will have tribulation 10 days. Be thou faithful unto death. Because Smyrna was such a pagan city, it was extremely hostile to the gospel and to the church. But for pagans, sacrificing to the gods was one of the most important acts. And to accommodate pagan sacrifices, Altars were scattered throughout cities to make it easier for those who wished to offer a sacrifice. And pagan altars came in a wide variety of sizes and shapes. Some were tall, some were short, some were round, some were square, long or even hexagonal. They were placed along the sides of streets and on street corners, as well as in marketplaces, gymnasiums, bathhouses, and every other public building. The highest form of pagan sacrifice was to offer a bull, but a sheep, goat, or some other kind of domestic animal could be used as well. Garlands of flowers, single flowers, cakes, and even food could also be offered as sacrifices. Worshippers offered sacrifices to express thanksgiving to the gods or as a means of requesting their help. Pagan sacrifices started with a long procession to the altar that was often accompanied with mystical music. The worshiper would first wash his hands with holy water and then shake the droplets of water from his hands onto the sacrificial animal as a sign that it was a holy sacrifice. The animal was then sheared and its fur was put into the sacrificial fire to be burned while the participants prayed. And before the animal was killed, barley was hurled on its back. Then its throat was slit and the blood was poured from its neck and collected in a bowl 
and poured onto the altar. The animal was then cut into pieces and the thigh bone was burned on the altar. And finally, wine was poured onto the altar and onto the ground around the altar and worshipers drank a portion of the wine as part of the religious ceremony. All of that occurred right here in these ancient ruins of Smyrna. Right now, I'm sitting on the ruins in the central marketplace of Smyrna. And these ruins are amazing because these are remnants of columns that are beige and pink. This marble was mined in central Anatolia and was brought here and it's very unusual, but that's important because this was not a typical market. This was the largest central market in all of Asia, only exceeded in size by Trajan's market in the city of Rome. And connected to this market was the Bulletarion. It's from the Greek word bulamai, which means I counsel. That's where all the city councilors met to make rules and marvelous, marvelous mosaics. And some of them are still visible from the first century. But in the city of Smyrna, Christians were really suffering for their faith. And this is what Jesus addressed in Revelation chapter two, verse nine, when he said to the believers in Smyrna, I know thy works and your tribulation and your poverty. They were experiencing tribulation and vast, deep, deep poverty. Many of them had lost their jobs simply because of their faith and because they wouldn't burn incense to the gods. Pagans viewed Christians as atheists. You say, how could a Christian be accused of being an atheist? Well, a normal pagan had statues and idols of gods in his home. It's obvious that he believed not just in a God, but in gods. But when you went into a Christian's home, it was absent of idols because Christians did not worship idols, but yet they did worship the one true God and they followed Jesus. But in the minds of pagans, they were absent of gods because they had no idols and they were called Christians. And for this reason, they lost their jobs and many of them suffered even giving up their lives, dying in this very marketplace for their faith. But Smyrna was a very important city and eventually the city was enhanced with many contributions from the Roman government. The city got bigger, the city got more powerful and this marketplace played a key role. Not far from here, was the city of Pergamum. To the south was the city of Ephesus. But the proconsul, who was the governor of the region, lived in Pergamum. Pergamum was an amazing, beautiful, spectacular city. But because Ephesus was so important, the governor, who was called the proconsul, had to regularly make trips to Ephesus. Well, that was quite a trip back in those days. So in route to Ephesus, the road passed through Smyrna and it became a stopover place for the proconsul, the governor. And when he came here, he didn't come alone. He came with high ranking dignitaries, a large attache of Roman soldiers to protect him. And when they came into this city, this city was literally teeming with business and with a very strong military presence. Eventually, the city of Smyrna became the second largest city in Asia, second only to Ephesus, which was 35 miles to the south. Ephesus was a regal city, the third largest city in the Roman Empire. But because Rome needed a base and an accessible route into other parts of Asia, Smyrna was ideal to allow ships to travel up the Hermas River into other parts of Asia. The big port at Smyrna was perfect to meet this need. It gave Roman ships and Roman troops unlimited access to the inner lands of the region. And over time, more power and more riches came to this coastal metropolis. As I've noted, the city of Ephesus was just 35 miles to the south. Pergamum was 60 miles to the northeast. And the main road that connected these two major cities came right through the center of Smyrna. And this is significant because it meant there was a lot of traffic in Smyrna going back and forth between Pergamum and Ephesus. It brought a lot of people here, including soldiers. 
And in fact, this large number of soldiers was because of Smyrna's strategic location on the Aegean Sea, along with the importance of its port, and it was a stopover for the proconsul and other high-ranking delegations of politicians. And any day of the week, soldiers walked the streets, they protected key buildings, they kept guard at the harbor, and they watched over traffic on the roads that connected Smyrna to other cities. And you can guess, wherever large numbers of soldiers lived, there was always a large prostitution business. And in Smyrna, prostitutes could be seen at the harbor, in the marketplaces, in the bathhouses, at the theater, and at the stadium, where men were gathered for competitions and sporting events. During sporting competitions, especially in big stadiums and coliseums, as the men would leave their seats to go to the bathroom, often they would be confronted by prostitutes who were waiting for them under the arches. In fact, the word fornication actually comes from the Latin word fornex, which is the Latin word for the arches in a stadium or a theater. The word fornication literally referred to a brief sexual encounter under the arches. In a Roman society, sex with a prostitute was not even considered adultery. So pagan men felt no sense of embarrassment or guilt to restrain them from a cheap moment of carnal pleasure. And in Smyrna, the prostitution business was prolific and pervasive. This was largely due to the presence of Roman troops and the steady influx of sailors and visitors to the coastal city. This practice of prostitution was so common that the Apostle Paul urged early believers in 1 Corinthians 6.15, Know ye not that your bodies are the members of Christ? Shall I then take the members of Christ and make them the members of a harlot? God forbid. Right now, I'm standing on top of the fortification wall on the very top of Mount Pagos. These really were walls built by the troops of Alexander the Great nearly 2,300 years ago. And from where I'm standing, I have a view of these walls as they snake around the top of this Acropolis. And if you look below, this is the modern Turkish city of Izmir. It is quite large. It's the third largest city in Turkey. It has 5 million people in its population. And just below in the harbor was once the great Roman port. In the distance was the ancient city of Smyrna, which was eventually abandoned. And you also look below and you can see the ruins of the state of Gore, where many, many Christians later were martyred for their faith. But the city of Smyrna was quite an amazing place. And from here, you could travel to Pergamum. From Pergamum, you could travel onward to Thyatira, then to Sardis, then to Philadelphia, then to Laodicea. And if you kept following the road, eventually it would take you back to the city of Ephesus. But Smyrna was located right between Pergamum and Ephesus. Well, the governor of the region lived in Pergamum, and he often had to go to Ephesus. So Smyrna became a stopping place where the governor and all of his troops would stop and stay all night. It was quite an important city. But in addition to being a stopover for high-ranking politicians and a lot of soldiers, Smyrna was very important because it overflowed with travelers who used it as a hub for their journeys to other cities in the region. This meant travelers needed to find lodging where they could spend the night. So the hotel industry in Smyrna had to be large enough to accommodate the arrival of many visitors. And to meet the needs of hungry travelers, the city required a large number of restaurants and cafes to be built through every quarter of the city. And for restaurants to function adequately, that meant there had to be an entire workforce employed to cook, to make bread and pastries, to serve tables, and to clean up. The double port harbor of Smyrna was large enough to receive many, many ships. And it was filled with ships carrying passengers who also came to shop at the massive lower marketplace in Smyrna, which was one of the largest markets in all of Asia, even larger than Ephesus' huge central marketplace. The truth is, Smyrna was renowned for both tourism and business. 
and the beautiful beaches gave vacationers one of the most beautiful panoramic seaside views in all of Asia, and the view at Sunside was just breathtaking. And all of this caused Smyrna to become a popular destination. But in addition to the beaches, thousands of religious pilgrims arrived regularly to worship in the city's many ancient pagan temples. But as important as all these factors were contributing to the prosperity of Smyrna, this road that I'm standing on, which is a real Roman road, makes me think about another road which also contributed to the prosperity of Smyrna in the first century. Smyrna was connected by a significant road to the kingdoms east of Asia Minor, that is to Assyria, and to Persia, two nations that were major trading partners with the Roman Empire. Darius I of Persia wanted to open a trade route for commerce between the East and the West, so he ordered the construction of the Royal Road. And during Greek and Roman times, that road reached all the way to the city of Smyrna. And that means there was a steady stream of merchants and visitors arriving from Eastern cities in Assyria and Persia. And that is why Smyrna's marketplaces were filled with expensive, exotic items like herbs, garments, silks, tapestries, and carpets. Items that were rare and hard to find in other cities, but items that were abundant in the lower marketplace near Smyrna's port. Right now, I'm seated near the banks of the Aegean Sea, and the Aegean Sea is just so beautiful. And it was very important to the prosperity of ancient Smyrna because it had a huge port. And flowing into the Aegean Sea, just north of ancient Smyrna, was the big river called Hermas, which flowed from here all the way into Phrygia. From central Phrygia, the river Hermes flowed toward the Aegean Sea and it was fed by tributaries that increased its depth and its width, which made it large enough for big ships to travel deep into the interior of the region. In fact, the river was deep enough for ships to take it all the way to the city of Sardis. Then from Sardis, it was still wide and deep enough for those ships to continue onward to Philadelphia in the east. It's likely that early preachers traveled by ship up the Hermas River to reach cities like Sardis and Philadelphia since this was the fastest route from the Aegean coast to inland cities. But nearby was also the Meles River, which also emptied into the Gulf of Smyrna. But near here was the huge Roman double port of Smyrna. And ships came and ships went, and the ships who came carried passengers who were coming to do business in the city of Smyrna, and with them was tons and tons of cargo. The only other port to compete with Smyrna was the harbor of Ephesus, but the port of Smyrna had no rival directly on the coast of Asia. By the first century, the port of Smyrna was one of the largest and most majestic in the entire Roman Empire, competing with other port cities like Rome, Alexandria, Ephesus, and Caesarea. But as ships steered toward the port, they sailed right alongside two long piers of stone that lined both sides of the port entrance. The head of each pier was decked with two large, marvelously crafted lions depicted devouring smaller beasts and one of them is now displayed in the ruins of the central marketplace in Izmir. But the placement of these lions at the entrance to the port of Smyrna was no accident. They conveyed a message to newcomers that Smyrna was a city of might, political power, and imperial ties. Newcomers were struck by gleaming marble structures that sprawled up the slopes of Mount Pagos all the way to the peak. Religious pilgrims 
came to worship at the temple of Sybil. And the entire city was fashioned from the port to the peak of Mount Pagos to epitomize the image of Sybil. Sybil was usually portrayed as a queen seated in a throne with lions at her side, beautiful pearls around her neck, and a majestic crown on her head. And as newcomers arrived by ship, they saw that the whole city was constructed to look like a statue of their goddess. With her feet planted at the sea, lions at the end of the two piers at the port to symbolize the lions at Sybil's side, her midsection laced with beautiful buildings and temples, and her head at the peak of Mount Pagos was topped with an ancient fortress to symbolize her majestic crown. So before their eyes, as newcomers arrived by ship, they could see the symbolic image of Sybil herself stretched out across the landscape before them, greeting them as they arrived at the port. Among the seven churches addressed by Jesus in the book of Revelation, the congregation of Smyrna suffered the worst. This dark and perilous city was the backdrop of intense suffering by the believers in the early church. But Jesus was well aware of their faithful works, even in the midst of intense persecution. In the series, Take a Tour with Rick, Smyrna. Rick Renner walks you through the expansive archaeological sites of ancient Smyrna, a city now known as Izmir which sits on Turkey's Aegean coast. Follow along as Rick explores the rich history of this formidable city and its application to our lives today as overcomers in Christ. This five-part documentary-style visual series is available in digital or physical format starting at just $11. We're also offering the book No Room for Compromise, a full-color, beautifully illustrated, hardbound book that will captivate you and your family for years to come. On every page, Rick reveals the realities that early believers faced as the church began to flourish in a dark pagan world. With fascinating insights and historical context, you'll have a greater appreciation and understanding of Scripture and how you should interpret it for today. No Room for Compromise is available for $80. And you can also order the five-part series Christ's Message to Smyrna, starting at $11, depending on the format selected. This classic teaching is filled with relevance for the last day's church. Don't miss this special bundle, the illuminating audio-video series Take a Tour with Rick. Smyrna the book No Room for Compromise, and the series Christ's Message to Smyrna. Call the number on your screen or go to renner.org to order. Call or go online now. Hey friends, where do you think I am right now? This is my old TV set. I used to teach all my programs and come to you from right here in every program, but now I'm working in the new studio because you helped us to build it. And I wanna say thank you. But you may ask, well, what's gonna go on in this old studio? This old studio is being transformed into a new TV studio for our new TV network, which is called the Good News Channel. Think about that. God gave us a satellite network and a federal channel in Russia that has the potential to reach into every home. We actually have a federal license, which allows us to take the signal of our network into every single home. That is just amazing. And I don't think anyone else has ever received this particular license. Only God could open a door that big. Wow. And now we're renovating the old studio. We're gonna completely change it. And from this space, we're gonna begin filming new daily TV programs for the new satellite network and the new federal channel, which is called the Good News Channel. The gospel is such good news, and we need to take it into every home. And if you're already a part of the giving team, thank you so much for being a partner. And if you're not a part of the giving team yet, please pray about being part of the giving team to help us renovate this studio and to develop our new channel so we can take it into every home of Russia, and not just Russia, but around the world to wherever there are Russian speakers. They need the Word of God. And together with you, 
we can take them the light that will transform their lives. And I want to say thank you now for being a part of our giving team. Someone asked the question, what about snake handling? Well, believe it or not, there really are certain churches in the back hills of some states that believe you're supposed to pick up deadly snakes. So at a certain moment in their services, they open the snake cages and they pull out water moccasins and rattlesnakes and copperheads and begin to pass them through the congregation to demonstrate their faith because they believe Jesus told them to pick up snakes in Mark 16, verse 18. But in Mark 16, verse 18, when Jesus said we will handle snakes, he wasn't really telling us to pick up intentionally dangerous snakes. He was sending us to the ends of the world. And Jesus was giving us a promise of protection that if you obey me and you take the gospel to the ends of the earth, even if you run into a snake or any dangerous situation, my protective promises will be with you and you'll be all right. This was a specific promise to anyone who would take the gospel to the ends of the earth. If you've never received Jesus as your Savior and Lord, now is the time for you to experience a new life Jesus has to give you. Pray this prayer with me right now. Lord, I repent of my sin and receive you as my Savior and Lord. Wash away my sin and make me completely new. I thank you that my sin is removed and Satan no longer has any right to lay claim on me. I faithfully promise that I will serve you as my Lord for the rest of my life. Amen. If you just prayed the prayer of salvation with us, would you please let us know by going to renner.org forward slash salvation? We would love to connect with you. Renner Ministries is proclaiming the gospel of Jesus Christ through every available media to the uttermost parts of the earth. Discover the many ways you can help us make a difference in lives around the world with the Word of God. We invite you to partner with us in teaching, strengthening, and rescuing lives for the glory of God. Together, we can make a difference that will last throughout eternity. This program was made possible by the giving of the God-called partners of Renner Ministries. If that teaching helped you, would you please subscribe, like, and comment so more people can see it.